On the breakfast, the Court of Appeals sitting in Abuja discharged Namdi Kanu, leader of the indigenous people of Biafra IPOP, of terrorism charges. Also on the breakfast, as breast cancer awareness continues in October, we'll be speaking with a health expert on the issue. And don't forget, we'll also be looking through today's newspapers, analyzing the biggest stories of the day. Welcome, it's a beautiful Tuesday morning and it feels really great to have you back on the show with us. It promises to be two hours of great conversation and a great insight. Now, and I hope that you will be with us all the way. I am Messi Bokwo and thanks for joining us. As always, we we'll start off with our conversation, top trending. These are issues that are, uh, you know, that we have a lot of engagement, reaction from different quarters, uh, talking about social media and off social media. Now, one of that is that, you know, the president of Asu Emmanuel Sudoke has uh, complained about uh, lecturers not having transport fare, you know, to go to school or to go uh, for lectures or to resume, however you want to look at it. But let's let's get back to the conversation. We know that ASU has actually been on that particular strike for eight months. And on the eighth month, the call of the strike, that's on the 14th of October. However, uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Miller, had expressed pleasure with the decision of the union to suspend the strike. Now, according to them, they said that um, the decision to call off the strike allows students and public uh, university to resume academic activities. But, uh, you know, the speaker, added, the speaker added that the suspension of the strike does not mean that the issues of funding, education, uh, education standard and st student welfare have been resolved. So that's it. But like I mentioned earlier on, the president of the union uh, disclosed that members of the body may find it very delicate to get back to their separate schools on Monday. That was yesterday, as I do not have money for transport. So you, <laughs> sounds very funny. And he said that unlike those days, it was very easy when lecturers or, you know, lecturers leave the uh, staff quarters, that's what you call it, very close to the premise of the school, or premises, if you want to say. But he said that that's a different, you know, uh, conversation right now because some of them live like 20 30 kilometers away from the school and following uh the strike uh they haven't been paid for about eight months and so that's a conversation i mean it just goes to show what's going on with us and the government however i i read that also i mean we talked about the thoughts of femic bajabia miller talking about that uh, the strike that have been called does not necessarily mean that uh, all of the issues have been resolved, uh, talking about uh, standard of education, what have you, that has not been resolved. Uh, it just means that it, allow, it allows room for negotiation and more conversation. But this is the issue. I think that it might just, just will be a subtle way to say that, hey, government were, were slowing down. It's a possibility that we probably might just embark on another strike action because... We haven't been paid, but I, I want you to think about it. I want you to imagine this. What would it mean for you to work and not be paid for eight months? How do you, you know, survive? How do you go through the entire process? I think that this lectures probably might just be going through a lot. We hear that some of these lectures have died and in the course of all of this, because a lot of them depend on uh, what has to coming for them to pay for their medical bills and what have you. It, it might necessarily be a lot. But what we will do here as a station is that we will monitor the activities uh, right here at the universities to see if academic activities have resumed in different universities, as it were. Now, that's to, uh, you know, make sense of the fact that uh, the ASU chairman or president has actually complained of members not having transportation for to go about lectures or to go to school and have to go about their businesses. It's, it's really saddening. There might also be a tendency that, you know, if the government does not act, because as it is, uh, the pay, uh, salaries have not been paid for the past eight months. 
And that's why this complaint has been put out. But like I mentioned rightly, we would also be looking out at uh, whether or not uh, academic activities have resumed in uh, our universities. Okay, and we'll bring you all of the report. But away from that, let's talk about the flood and the flooding situation in Nigeria. It's, it's really unfortunate and saddening. Well, the federal government has actually set up two measures, uh, flood fund and national policies on flood insurance to mitigate the effects of floods in the country. That document on National Flood Emergency Preparedness and Response Plan, which was obtained uh, by, you know, uh, reports. I mean, those who are looking for information, we got that uh, document. And it shows that flood fund will be drawn from 0.1% of monies released from crude oil account and 0.1% of taxes generated by Federal Inland Revenue Service. And other expected funding avenues are donation, endowment, grants and gifts. Also included as fund sources are emergency and disaster management related to budget lines in ministries, departments, agencies, uh, budgets, ecological fund, any emergency fund, donor partners, and any presidential directives. Uh, the list is almost endless. So I, I really don't understand because as of yesterday when we spoke with our resource person, there were several complain, uh, complaints about the government not responding. Um, we're not aware of any response from the federal government as regards the flooding and what's going on, especially uh, with the situation with Cameroon and the dam and the water that's been released. However, there was an agreement that was not respected by the Nigerian government or the Nigerian people. And that's very, very responsible, you know, for the flooding situation that we're faced with. It's quite saddening. But it sounds like all of this proposal and propositions of government is, uh, you would like to say that this is a long-term projection. This is like, you know, long-term. We're talking about the now. What is done? Houses have been destroyed. Lives and properties are lost in the course of this. People have died. People will die. Property is going to be lost. It's, it's, it's A lot is coming. And we understand that uh, a lot of states that are around this particular region. And it might just trickle down because it's a trickle down effect. What if it gets across the entire, you know, country? We're talking about the 30 states uh, of the Federation, including the FCT. What becomes, you know, Nigeria? So I, I really don't understand uh, what's happening. I mean, we have been trying to understand, you know, the dynamics, the fact that there's no response uh, that we are aware of at this point in time from the government. We're talking about short-term solution. We're not talking about long-term solution. What can we do now to save the situation? We have people who are dying. You know, lives and properties have been lost on a daily basis. And economic activities have been cut short. Uh, there's also a prediction of food crisis. Uh, we might just also be facing food insecurity. These are some of the issues. What are we doing, you know, to solve the problem? What are we doing now? What are the short-term plans? Because this looks like, you know, a lot of process. We're talking about bureaucratic process uh, that might just, you know, hamper. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, the Nigerian government and all stakeholders, the state government, would wake up. Everyone would uh, be up and uh, be ready to ensure that we have at all of this danger that's happening. Okay, so the states that are around, let's begin to look at how we can, you know, mitigate the issue, what we can do, save the people. Do we need to declare a state of emergency? Because if we declare a state of emergency, it would just allow, uh, you know, help to come from different parts of the world. Already we have uh, some organization bodies already trying to help other situation and help people survive. You, I'm, I'm sure you don't even want to think about you being in that situation. It's not something you want to imagine, but it's, it's unfortunate and it's very saddening. And to all of the people who have lost their lives in the course of all of this, we ask that their soul rest in peace. And we hope that the government of Nigeria would rise up you know, to her responsibility. Away from that, this will be the last for us. Festus Kiemo has reacted to the massive protests in France. So I'd like to read up 
uh, from his Twitter handle, verified Twitter handle of Festus Kiyama that got a lot of Nigerians talking. So he took to Twitter about, uh, you know, some hours ago and he said, massive protests on the streets of Paris over soaring prices. Meanwhile, some are still planning to jackpa abroad. Jackpa is uh, a word that's very, very peculiar to us. Okay. So if you hear someone say Jackpa, just say he's a Nigerian or he lives in Nigeria and he understands what it means to Jackpa. Uh, as if Nigerians or Nigeria is in isolation from the present global issues, some who knows the issues are already deceiving Nigerians and playing local politics with global issues. Now, this was actually a thought that was put out by Festus Kiamo on his verified Twitter handle with a video. I'm hoping that I wish we can actually put out that video. You would see the crowd. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. I haven't seen this kind of, I mean, uh, population gathered at the time. Look at that. This is so much. A lot of people gathered. That's a protest. Now, what happened with this, uh, you know, post, unfortunately, I, I was hoping, I'm sure that Festus Kiyama was hoping to get a different reaction from Nigerians, but he got another reaction that I'm sure he never anticipated. And some people queried. Today, uh, we're looking at uh, today's the 18th day in the month of October, two days more before uh, an anniversary of the Lekki protests. Some people said, oh no, how can you compare, what's the essence of this comparison? If you were in your country, would Nigerians, can Nigerians actually go on the streets, just as you have right there in France, people trunking out to protest about, you know, the global situation, talking about inflation, the hike in the prices of goods and services in France. That's it. Can Nigerians go out on the street and have this protest without any form of resistance from the government or intimidation? It's the questions that is a question that a lot of Nigerians have posed, you know, to this particular post from Festus Kiyamo. And no one is even talking about whether or not, because there's no, uh, there's no climb or there's no country, there's no perfect system, there's no perfect government, because there are no absolutes, they're just relative. And that's what it is. Protest has always been a tool that, you know, the people have used to achieve a result over the years. And that's what it is. Protest has also been a tool. People use protest as a tool to demand good governance, good policy. And this is not different from what you're seeing in France. As much as you say there's a global inflation and Nigeria is not living in isolation, but can we cast them out back? Can we take our minds back to the time where things were not the way they were in 2015 or prior to 2015? I mean, looking at the economy, what have we been able to achieve? Yesterday, we had a guest who talked about, you know, a certain issue right here on the show. And we're talking about the issue of flooding and food insecurity. And he said that it would really be wrong for us as a country to constantly blame the, the war in Ukraine and uh, COVID and what have you on the current economic situation of the country. Because prior to this time, we existed as a country and we had our issues, issues that were very peculiar. The issue of insecurity, he thrived and he also contributed to, you know, some of the issues that we're, we're experiencing. If you also talk about the fact that we're very reliant on oil and its earnings, let's also talk about our ability to meet our quota. These are internal issues, so uh, it would be unfair, like our resource person said, for us to blame all of the issues that we're faced with as a country on external issues and also forgetting the fact that we have been very uh, big on internal crisis, uh, the fact that we're able to live up to expectation internally and uh, you, you just have to meet up with the current reality of the globe because we don't live in isolation. But that has been the issue. But it's also important as a reminder for every government at all quarters and everywhere to understand that protection of lives and property, ensuring that, you know, uh, security is provided to everyone, it's always government responsibility. Government exists for this reason. That is why government exists. The people will submit their will, they will pay their taxes, they will do X, Y, Z, and in turn the government will provide, you know, the basic things of life. But have we been able as a people uh, to live up to expectation. And we, you know, respected, you know, the social contracts. That's it this morning on off, uh, our top trending. We'll take a break and when we return, we'll be looking at the front pages of the National Dailies. We call it Off the Press. Please stay with us. Good morning.